Professor Dr. Indrani Karuna Sagar. Dr. Indrani is the director for the Center for Science Education and Research, Nite University, Mangalore. She is an internationally renowned scientist in the area of biomedical education and research. She is the recipient of several national and international rewards and has been nominated by UNESCO as Director of Microbial Resources Center in Marine Biotechnology. Her research experiences have helped in developing and commercializing biotechnologies in the area of diagnostics and health management. She has over 300 publications in High Impact Factor National and International Journals. Mr. Chair, Co-Chair, Reporters, and thank you Dr. Shekhar for introducing me to the audience. At a time when it has become very, very important to see what is the causative agent of diseases, we are at crossroads to find out whether diseases are primary in nature or is it very complex because of the breakdown of the delicate balance between the host, pathogen and the environment. This is very much the case and if we look at every outbreak that has taken place, we almost feel we are like Sherlock Holmes waiting to find the criminal but it takes a very, very long time because there are so many clues left behind about a criminal, but we fail to arrive at who that person is. The early mortality syndrome has become synonymous with another condition which is called as AHPND, but at the same time, we need to remember that all these diseases that we see in the aquatic environment are very complex because of the dynamic nature of aquatic environment. Going back to Professor Patrick Sorgelos and his theory of microbial management being very important, we need to have a relook to see are we managing properly. When we advise farmers to look at certain bacterial counts in the environment in which the animals are growing, are we doing the right job in taking punitive action and asking them to apply antibiotics so that certain autochthonous native microorganisms of the environment are rested? But this becomes an issue since pathogenic ones take over and many innocuous microorganisms that have maintained the balance disappear from the scenario. So in a sense, the real look in letting farmers know that microbial management is very, very important in any farming system is akin to what we see in our own health issues. We talk about having gut flora, which has a predominance of E. coli, but we are also well aware that there are certain pathotypes of an organism like E. coli. Do we destroy all of the E. coli in order to address some pathotype? This is what has been happening in the environment with respect to early mortality syndrome. So there are opportunistic organisms that take over. Having said this, what we need to say is many of the diseases are referred to as syndromes. There may be a primary agent, but the problem essentially relates to a multitude of agents and abiotic factors come in the way of converting it into a very serious issue. HIV, we know, causes AIDS. AIDS is the syndrome, but HIV is the virus. But one is attempting to always look at AIDS to treat and manage rather than only thinking about HIV. So any new disease, we have to differentiate between the primary and the opportunistic pathogen because there are so many microbial agents that can cause diseases and therefore as I said, we have to work like Sherlock Holmes to find out even when there is a first outbreak or record of it. And when we look at the evidence, we have to ask, what is it due to? And then how did it come about? When did this happen first? Is it only when we saw it as mortality? Or did it exist even before? 
And where has it been recorded? Anyway, before we have actually reported it from some point? Or why did it have to happen at this point of time? And finally, of course, how did it happen and how do we manage it? So disease is something where there is a deviation from the normal or good health. And we don't have to imply the cause of the deviation, but when we see an altered physiology, we need to take that already into consideration. So in aquaculture, we need to remember that wild and farmed animals are susceptible and many of the pathogens are carried also by healthy animals. So health and disease are never uh, static. It's a very dynamic one linked to environmental factors. I say all of this with my own experience because when early mortality syndrome got first reported in Vietnam, though we know that the first outbreaks were already in China, um, when it was referred to as the covert mortality syndrome, and then when other countries in Asia started reporting it, and in India there was mortality, there was very strong lobby to say it is the early mortality syndrome caused by the Vibrio parahemolyticus, which was the hero then, and they called it, of course, the AHPND. But we, with the scientific evidence, could prove to the world it was almost a challenge, both facing the government of India and all other nations. So whether presenting the topic of the organism not being one that causes AHPND, but causing vibriosis, in conferences in Mexico, Panama, Vietnam, we could put at rest through the scientific interventions of at a molecular level with having done uh, at least a dozen sequences of the isolate to prove that it was not the HPND strain. And therefore, to this day, even through the surveillance program, which involves the entire country, we, it has been proved that HPND is not there in India, as seen by using the molecular diagnostic tool, though vibriosis exists. So prevalence always of all these infections has a very great environmental background and seasonal variations. So what we need to really look at is how climate change is impacting. So when I hear about specific pathogen-free, in relation to early mortality syndrome where the causative agent may be many, not just what we expect to find, we need to remember that an SPF being prepared is not very easy for a pathogen that has established itself in the environment. And when it comes to the early mortality syndrome due to Vibrio parahemolyticus, definitely not, because Vibrios are autochthonous to the environment. So even if you use culturable tools or metagenomic uh, tools and look at sediment or look at gut of shrimps, you will find that they're full of vibrios. And therefore, if we say we are having SPF animals, we need to remember it will be only until it is released into the environment. The moment it's there, it is in contact. And why is the great worry? It is because there is, of course, a lot of horizontal transfer going on through transmissible elements, which are carrying some of the toxin genes from varied organisms and bringing it to the pathogens to something that was innocuous but has become a pathogen. Having been born about the time when Vibrio parahemolyticus was born, it has been a journey together in our research on this organism. And therefore, while we were all the time examining the human pathogenic Vibrio parahemolyticus, a lot of the data collected then, a lot of the basic studies done with that organism has come into good use in trying to look at the agent in the present scenario. So the One Health Initiative has never been as important as it is today. And if we think we have now solved all the problem, we need to remember because of the environmental changes and the changes being brought about by human intervention, there is bound to be newer and newer strains of organisms coming about due to certain toxins or due to certain other pathogenic attributes that are transferred. So if we look at vibrios in general and some of these pathogenic vibrios in particular, we will see that they are associated with all kinds of aquatic animals. And therefore, to think that we can get rid of them by using antibiotics 
or by using strategies which may not be for the best of the environment health, we are only compounding the problem even more than before. Having said that now, and having got a lot of clues from the organisms that have affected humans in many ways, Vibrio cholerae, which has been very, very old organism, and then you have Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio parimolticus as human uh, pathogens, we see that the Vibrios in the environment have been classified as those that affect humans and those that affect aquatic animals. In aquatic animals today, we talk about the Vibrio harvey clade. While we were all very familiar with the luminescent Vibrio, uh, having heard only about it and not about the seriousness of paramolticus that brings about mortalities, probably it came as a root shock when early mortality syndrome attributed mainly to Vibrio paramolticus was discussed at length all over the world. But today we realize it's much more deep than that. So some pathogenic bacteria which occur in the coastal waters, they have certain requirements. One is they are associated all the time with some of the aquatic animals and plants, the zooplankton, mollusks, crustaceans, shellfish, and finfish. And what is very important is the chitin that is present, which serves as a substrate for this particular organism, Vibrio groups, especially Vibrio paramolticus, to sustain, multiply, and be able to form biofilms, will never allow us to eradicate them the way we think that all kinds of treatment with disinfectants, with antibiotics, is going to solve the problem. In fact, it is compounding, as I said before. So ecology is always influenced by temperature and salinity, and so the basic studies relating to the ecology, distribution of organisms, and virulence attributes form the basis for all the serious studies that should come about later. Now, why has some of the features of organisms become important. If we talk about one example, like Vibrio paramolticus, though there are many others that cause met um, early mortality syndrome. Very recently, study of a cohort in, a um, uh, cohort of about uh, 200 farms in uh, Thailand showed that there were many organisms associated with early mortalities, which included, of course, some viruses that was on the lesser side, but enterocytosome and hepatopenia, then we have Vibrio parahemolyticus, and there were other agents also that were associated. And so it was not to the exclusion of all agents that EMS was considered to be only due to Vibrio parahemolytical. Having said that, EMS in India has also been talked about as running mortality syndrome. So the covert mortality syndrome in China and then the early mortalities that were reported in other Asian countries, and now the running mortalities have been due to various agents, with Vibrio being very important. Now, Vibrio parahemolyticus has, especially the one carrying a particular toxin gene, has certain versatilities. And while we talk about certain basic aspects, like it having two chromosomes, the transfer RNA in it is a hotspot, for insertion of novel DNA and gene acquisition. Now, this is very important. When it happens, why it happens, what are the triggering factors are very important. So having now got inserted with some toxin gene that is resulting in mortalities, is it that the, it's never going to happen again or that we have drawn a lot of lessons to see that be prepared that it might happen again and again. Corum sensing, which we have really not looked into so much in Vibrio paramolticus, is very, very important. This adaptive mechanism to stress, such as low nutrient, salinity changes, predation, and also, of course, a lot of exposure to ultraviolet light. And in India, whatever happened due to vibriosis was due to two cyclones that came about one after another, resulting in a lot of turbulence. And this turbulence had probably become very useful for some pathogenic vibrios to get themselves enriched in an environment and then bring about the mortalities. It was a challenge proving to the world that it was not AHPND. So quorum sensing regulations, 
I will only be presenting some of our work because many others are also working on all of this, but international cooperation in some of the studies has helped a lot in moving forward. And using some of the notobiotic systems, we'll be able to prove even more the role of quorum sensing. So the ability to form biofilms, as I mentioned, is paramount to the survival of this organism at times when the disease is not there. And we know shrimps molt. And when there is a lot of molting, we have a lot of chitin available for this organism, which serves as a substrate, a nutrient for them to multiply and enrich themselves. Role of chitin in the survival of this organism was studied about three and a half decades ago by our group. And at that time, it was more related to the human pathogenic vibrios. It is no different than what is happening today with the environmental fitness of Vibrio parahemolticus to cause the shrimp disease. So the interaction between plankton and VP also is very, very important. Fine moment. Okay. So I will steal some of the ti question time to present what I have, if the chair agrees. And you know, um, the role of plankton in the oceanic spread is also very important in looking at the ways the organism might have moved. There are many, many virulence attributes to the organism. And so it could be one or all of them coming into play in the establishment of the agents. Now, new genomic islands are being identified by the day through the transfers that are going on between the organism, the horizontal transfers. So when we talk about EMS, we should not think that it is synonymous with the AHPND, which is due to, of course, the necrosis to the hepatopancreas, the acute necrosis. In fact, present in this hall is Dr. Kalaya, and we have one of the very recent papers which talks about a new mutant, which is PIR-A, that is the toxin PIR-A negative, but PIR-B positive, and this toxin is not expressed during the studies in the laboratory, but it does not also cause any pathology, but it brings about mortality. So here we are now talking about doing away with some of the paradigms that have been there, where we have told farmers, where diagnostic kits are relying on looking at only PIR A, PIR B toxin. So I think all of these studies that are coming about will add a lot of value. And of course, this is about the agent itself, the toxins, which is a little basic, not to worry. And therefore, our own study on diversity during the disease outbreak, coupled with the whole genome sequencing, helped a lot to set at rest the fact that in India, HPND is there and it was missed. Our surveillance programs have further enhanced the capability to detect it, but they have confirmatively shown it is not there. And mental factors are very important to study. And of course, it's always good to be careful. And the study by Boyd, on a large number of farms where they looked at uh, water quality parameters in farms that had HPND and those that did not have, they found no difference. And they found the quality bad in both the places. And therefore, it means we have to improve the quality, yes, of the water. This is, of course, the cohort study that I already mentioned. This is 2018. Asian Fishery Science has a whole collection of very relevant papers on HPND that can lead us. And as I already mentioned, organisms like Enterocytosoma and Hepatopene have been considered a very important risk factor. And then you have polychaetes that have been talked about as potential risks by some groups. But then can we do away with polychaetes? No. Even if you examine them, you find one. Are you going to be able to say, no, don't use polychaetes at all? It is important to lose, use techniques such as colony hybridization to target that one among a million organism, if you think the one bacteria with the toxin is very important for you. It is not enough to use a lot of enrichment methods to get it out, but simple plating and using techniques like loop-mediated isothermal amplification or uh, performing uh, colony hybridization to target them would be a good way forward. Complete genome sequences have been available, which are allowing us to look at the genetic diversity also presented by other groups in the world. And now, I'm coming to the end. Is the Mexican strain different from the Asian strain? Yes. Molecular tools have helped to show that a 4,243 base pair 
transposon element found in Mexican strain was not found in Vietnam, Thailand, and China. The number of nine base pair small sequence repeats found within the coding region of a hypothetical protein varied. The small sequence repeats with six repeats found in Mexican strain, five repeats in Vietnamese strain, four in China, Thailand, and Vietnamese strain prove beyond doubt that it's unlikely that the same strain is traveling happily everywhere. And so now, this is my last slide, instead of this topic, which was put as a question in the start, is again for all of us to answer, and accordingly advise farmers on how to manage. Let us not advise a zero or a reduced Vibrio count, because most of the Vibrios are happy members of the aquatic environment, allowing to maintain the ecology. And it is unfair to alter that balance by using antibiotics, too many disinfectants, which are good for selling, but at the same time, they are disturbing the ecology. In trying to achieve all of this, the perturbation is too much for uh, the normal flora, and the one pathogen survives and um, becomes very serious. Thank you all for your kind attention.